Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Georges Benjamin, and I'm the chair of the Committee for the Analysis to Enhance the Effectiveness of the Federal Quarantine Station Network. And this is based on lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to welcome everyone to the open session of the committee's third meeting. And I want to note this is an open, on-the-record information gathering session. And that is, the committee is in the process of assembling materials that it will examine and discuss uh, in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. Now, this is the third session of the third meeting of approximately five planned full committee meetings. Some of these meetings may include public sessions where we have the opportunity to hear from experts in the field. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it must then go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee. And the committee must then respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's Report Review Committee and the Chair of the National Research Council before it is considered an NRC report. Now, the expected re report release is May of 2022. And further information on the study, including future meetings, can be found on the website. The open session today provides an opportunity for the committee to learn about legal considerations. And during the Q&A session and discussion, the committee questions and comments will take priority. Certainly, the public can submit comments to the study um, by doing so at the um, study email address listed on the project website. This meeting is being recorded. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, William Chang, who is the former deputy counsel um, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, William. Good morning. I'd like to thank the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in this committee for inviting me to speak here today. I'm also grateful that the committee has devoted significant attention to the legal issues that this pandemic has brought forth with respect to CDC's ability to take regulatory actions, protect us not just from COVID, but also future public health threats caused by communicable diseases. Before COVID, there was little judicial precedent on the scope of CDC's regulatory authority here. That has changed. Over the last year, we saw two federal courts of appeals reach opposite conclusions on the scope of the CDC's regulatory authority to control the introduction and spread of communicable diseases across our country. And for the first time, the United States Supreme Court addressed the issue. Following along what some refer to as a conservative liberal divide, the court arrived at a split 6-3 decision that narrowed the CDC's regulatory authority. Notably, the same 6-3 split of the Supreme Court also decided the recent Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, case. In that case, the court struck down the federal mandate to vaccine or test and mask in America's large workplaces. That decision also relied, in part, on the Supreme Court's earlier decision to limit the CDC's regulatory authority. On their faces, the decisions addressing CDC's regulatory authority could have rested on what lawyers call a plain language reading of the statute authorizing such regulatory action. So the legal analyses could have ended there, but they didn't. Those opinions went on to discuss the broader separation of powers implications and the proper role of federal agencies in our constitutional system. Eugene Scalia, the former secretary of labor under President Trump and the son of the late Justice Antonin Scalia discussed that dynamic in his recent Wall Street Journal opinion on the Supreme Court's OSHA decision. He observed that placing constraints on the administrative state is a defining concern of the Roberts Court. He further observed that each of the three newest members of the Supreme Court 
are arguably more interested than the justices they replaced in articulating jurisprudence that constrains federal agencies' ability to assume responsibility ordinarily performed by Congress or the courts. I am here to discuss that defining concern of the Roberts Court, in particular, the major questions doctrine and the non-delegation doctrine. Those doctrines have significant implications for the scope of CDC regulatory authority to control the introduction and spread of communicable diseases. But before I dive into those topics, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Will Chang, and I am currently Vice President of Regulatory Policy and Chief Legal Counsel at McKesson Corporation. I appear today in my individual capacity and the views that I express are mine alone. The reason I was invited to speak to you today was that from 2019 to 2021, I served as Deputy General Counsel at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Given that service, attorney-client privilege, and other privileges, I will not discuss any legal counsel I may or may not have provided to HHS or any of its agencies, and you should not draw any inferences in that regard based on what I say today. Now, when I joined HHS on April Fool's Day in 2019, one of my first projects was the initiative to end the HIV epidemic in Ready, Set, Prep, the program that makes HIV prevention medication free to all uninsured and at-risk individuals across the country, either at brick and mortar pharmacies or by mail. That program is still running today and rests on donations from the pharmaceutical company and many of the nation's chain and independent pharmacies. After that experience, and less than a year into my time at HHS, in December 2019, the general counsel asked me if I were interested in expanding my portfolio as deputy general counsel to include the public health division. That division supports the work of the CDC, the NIH, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, who became the nation's testing czar, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, which includes the Strategic National Stockpile, the Public Health Service Corps, and other agencies within HHS. The General Counsel assured me that taking on those additional responsibilities would not be much additional work. I remember that assurance very clearly even today. The rest was unprecedented history. For the rest of my time at HHS, I had the honor of working shoulder to shoulder with some of the best people, not just across the HHS agencies, but across the federal government. From the Department of Homeland Security and Transportation on safeguarding travel to the Department of Defense on Operation Warp Speed. They worked around the clock through weekends and holidays and the phone was never on do not disturb or if the crescent moon setting. They are professionals and dedicated civil servants in the best ways who tuned out the noise and focused on the mission. For this committee and for this meeting, I'd like to specifically acknowledge Dr. Marty Setron and his team at the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, Dr. Nita Patel and her team from Operation Warp Speed, as well as HHS Office of the General Counsel Attorneys, Joe Foster, Kevin Malone, Lisa Thombley and Jim Mizrahi, who support the CDC branch. They are just a few among the many who worked and continue to work behind the scenes and they deserve more credit than they will ever receive. Now I turn to the issue that we're here to discuss today. Emily, can you please display the slide of the CDC authorizing statute? Thank you. I'm going to start with the organic legislation that authorizes the CDC to make and enforce regulations to control communicable diseases. The statutory provision is the one you see before you at 42 USC 264A. It's two sentences and 107 words, and they split two courts of appeals in the United States Supreme Court. Sentence one, the CDC director is authorized to make and enforce such regulations as in his judgment are necessary to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into the states or possessions, or from one state or possession 
into any other state or possession. Sentence two, for purposes of carrying out and enforcing such regulations, the CDC director may provide for such inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, destruction of animals or articles found to be so infected or contaminated as to be sources of dangerous infection to human beings, and seven, the catch-all provision, other measures, as in his judgment may be necessary. So the first sentence essentially says that the CDC director may do whatever or take whatever regulatory action that the director believes is necessary to address the introduction and interstate spread of COVID. The legal question is whether that second sentence limits those regulatory actions to the seven enumerated categories, inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, extermination, destruction, other similar measures, or does the second sentence expand the broadly worded authority in the first sentence to make clear that the director can take regulatory actions on personal property? This kind of legal question begins with the plain language of the statute. If that yields a clear answer, then Korea, it's over. In the CDC eviction moratorium cases, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals conclude that the text of the statute does not grant the CDC the power it claims. In other words, according to that court, the second sentence limits the first sentence. The DC Circuit Court reached that opposite conclusion. Quote, the CDC eviction moratorium falls within the plain text of the statute. When the issue reached the Supreme Court, the six justice majority also concluded the language was clear. Reading both sentences together, rather than the first in isolation, it is a stretch to maintain that the statute gives the CDC the authority to impose the eviction moratorium. With similar conviction, the three justice dissent, penned by Justice Breyer and joined by Justice Sotomayor and Kagan, concluded that the statute's second sentence is naturally read to expand the agency's powers by providing congressional authorization to act on personal property when necessary. So about the only thing that all the judges and justices addressing this issue was clear on was that the text of the statute was clear. They just reached the opposite conclusions on what the text was clear on. So what's really going on here? Is the issue really that nine circuit judges and justices are better or worse at comprehending the English language than the other six judges and justices? As the late Justice Scalia used to say, to ask is to answer. The OSHA decision that I mentioned from last week shed some light on what's really going on here. Remember, it's the same 6-3 uh, split of the Supreme Court. Writing for the concurrence in that case, Justice Gorsuch, joined by Justices Thomas and Alito, began that opinion with a two-word question. The central question we face today is, who decides? Elaborating later, they explained the question before us is not how to respond to the pandemic, but who holds the power to do so? Writing for the dissent in that case, Justice Breyer, joined by Justices Kagan and Sotomayor, agreed on that central question. Underlying everything else in this dispute is a single simple question. Who decides how much protection and of what kind American workers need from COVID-19? That simple question is anything but. Who decides? Is it Congress? Because its members are, according to some, the most democratically accountable to the American people? Is it a federal agency like the CDC? Because according to some, it has the expertise and the ability to respond quicker than Congress can, particularly when responding to fast evolving national emergencies like the one that we continue to face. Is it a state or a local government out of respect for federalism? From the founding of our nation to now, the answers given to that question has not always been clear or consistent. 
Like I mentioned before, the eviction moratorium case was the first time the Supreme Court answered that question for the CDC's regulatory authority to handle communicable diseases. And to answer that question of who decides, lean heavily in favor of Congress, with the court concluding, it is up to Congress, not CDC, to decide whether the public interest merits further action here. And let's compare that with the OSHA concurrence from last week, answering a similar question for OSHA in the vaccine or test and mass mandate. There, those justices also said, the answer is clear. Under the law as it stands today, the power rests with the state and Congress, not OSHA, the federal agency. The legal doctrines underlying those conclusions are the major questions doctrine and a non-delegation doctrine and of particular significance here, they're gaining more traction. The major doc questions doctrine is a tool of statutory interpretation that says, we expect Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an executive agency decisions of vast economic and political significance. The doctrine concerns situations where Congress passes a broadly worded statute and leaves it to a federal agency to work out the details of implementation. The doctrine seeks to prevent an agency from using that broadly worded statute to do something that goes beyond what Congress had intended. To highlight this point, in its eviction moratorium decision, the Supreme Court rhetorically asked whether under the necessary to prevent language that you see before you of the CDC authorizing statute, could the CDC, for example, mandate free grocery delivery to the homes of sick or vulnerable, require manufacturers to provide free computers to enable people to work from home, order telecommunication companies to provide high-speed internet access to facilitate remote work. And remember, the CDC regulatory authority is enforceable by criminal fines as well as imprisonment. The Supreme Court thus concluded that the CDC's regulatory authority must be tethered to the specific activities listed in the second center, sentence. Otherwise, it is hard to see what measures this interpretation would place outside the CDC's reach and the government has identified no limit in the statute behind the requirement that the CDC deems a measure necessary, close quote. Now, where the major questions doctrine asks whether Congress has authorized agency regulatory action in the first place, the non-delegation doctrine asks whether Congress has done so in a constitutional manner. The non-delegation doctrine stands on a relatively controversial and longstanding principle that Congress cannot delegate to another branch power which is strictly and exclusively legislative. But the difficulty with applying that principle lies in that the Supreme Court has also said that Congress may obtain the assistance of its coordinate branches, and in particular, may confer substantial discretion on executive agencies to implement and enforce the laws. According to the Supreme Court, in our increasingly complex society, replete with ever-changing and more technical problems, Congress simply cannot do its job absent an ability to delegate power under broad general directives. So to balance that need for delegation with the respect for the separation of powers, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said that Congress may delegate legislative authority, but only if Congress provides an intelligible principle that provides sufficiently definite standards to guide executive discretion. Now that doctrine could further prevent CDC from exercising the broad regulatory authority in the first sentence. That's because even if Congress in light of the recent Supreme Court decision were to go back and to make clear that it had intended to confer such broad regulatory authority in the first sentence, which actually appeared in the legislative history of the original statute, but not in the text of the statute, 
the current Supreme Court may still conclude that such delegation would violate the non-delegation doctrine. It is possible that Justices Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito would reach that conclusion based on the concurrence in the OSHA case, evolving a statute that is arguably more specific than the one you see before you, the CDC's, in the first sentence. And whether two of the three other conservative justices would reach that conclusion, which is enough to provide a majority five justice opinion, is somewhat of an open question. What we do know is that four lower court federal judges, the Sixth Circuit panel that addressed the CDC's eviction moratorium, and the federal district judge who looked at this issue for Florida's lawsuit challenging CDC's conditional sale order, have already signaled that the non-delegation doctrine would prevent such a broad delegation of power from Congress as reflected in the first sentence of that statute. So to conclude, what does this all mean moving forward? On the major questions front, as things currently stand, CDC's regulatory power is constrained by the second sentence of the authorizing statute. And you might look at that second sentence and say, it says other measures, and that could be very broad. Well, I suggest that when we look at the case law as it stands, when it comes to that other measures provision in the second sentence, a court will likely require that such measures at a minimum directly relate to preventing the internet state spread of a disease by identifying, isolating, and destroying the disease itself, close quote. And that's from the Supreme Court's decision in the eviction moratorium case. And the Supreme Court referred to this as the direct targeting of disease that characterizes the measures identifying in the statute rather than an indirect or downstream connection. So the greater the impact of the regulatory action with respect to duration, reach, economic impact, political impact, the greater the judicial scrutiny particularly if the action involves things that are traditionally taken by state and local governments and public health authorities. On the non-delegation front, insofar as CDC or others may ask Congress to revise this statute to make clear that the second sentence does not limit, but expands the first sentence of the statute, I caution that such a request be made with the non-delegation doctrine in mind and more specificity may be needed in the first sentence. Otherwise, there is a real risk that the statute may be struck down under the non-delegation clause and CDC may end up with even less regulatory ability to protect this nation from public health threats. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss these important issues today. And I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very, very, very much. Um, so colleagues, um, yeah, I was, I was gonna ask you about that, that last um, clause because I remember as a state health official, um, when we went and rebooted our public health authorities, one of the reasons we did that was as a state health commissioner in Maryland, um, the, the, the statute opened up with the fact that basically the, the health commissioner could do anything they needed to, to, to protect the public's health. Um, and um, we were very much concerned about constitutional um, that holds it up in constitutional muster. So we did add some clarity to that. So I, 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 I see what you're saying there. Um, other questions? Stephen. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. It, it, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't necessarily appreciate all of the nuances of some of the things that you said, but my, sort of understanding of the Supreme Court decision related to the uh, OSHA uh, requirements for vaccination, part of their argument or part of what they stated was that they painted uh, all um, businesses with way too broad a stroke or too broad a brush um, to basically any that was over a hundred individuals and that the Supreme Court may have looked at it differently if they had been more targeted to which types of businesses they had imposed that requirement. And, and I guess, you know, the, 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 the same applies with some of the things that 
CDC did, is, is the issue that possibly some of these were just too broadly applied? Yeah, thank you for that observation. I think that is definitely one of the themes and it goes to the recommendation based on you know, what the Supreme Court said of that direct targeting of the disease itself and efforts to destroy or contain it. So again, you know, the tighter that connection, the more likely that regulatory action will survive judicial review. Jason. Uh, thank you, uh, Will, uh, for the wonderful presentation. I, I'm also not a lawyer, but in, in medicine, we, we usually use inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the, the, the two sentences, the two clauses, you, the, the, there's nothing that says, you know, what could be included and nothing that says what, could, what should be excluded. And, and under that circumstances, it seems to me that you always have challenges to these sort of clauses. So how do you suppose that uh, we resolve this question uh, in Congress going forward? Yeah, and fantastic question. And this is one of those things that split the courts. They read this, they all claim that the language is perfectly clear, right? <laughs> Reaching entirely opposite conclusions. So to summarize the positions, you know, those who say that the second sentence limits the first sentence will say, if the first sentence was really as broad as CDC claims it is, then the second sentence won't even be needed, right? And it's the classic rule of interpreting statutes that uh, Congress doesn't write things just for the fun of it. Every sentence has to be given a meaning. And then the other side, like Justice Breyer pointed out, well, that sentence, what it made clear is, given that under the Constitution, particularly under the Fourth Amendment, there's additional protection given anytime there's an intrusion on personal property, because personal property is a protected constitutional interest. That's why Congress spelled those things out very clearly in case that question ever came up before a court to make clear, yes, when we say everything, we mean everything, even if it touches on personal property. So that's where the uh, tension is. To answer your question specifically, in the legislative history of this statute, which goes back to, I think, 1944, one of the main drafters actually said pretty darn clearly, that the second sentence doesn't restrain the first sentence, it's meant, it's meant to expand the second sentence. The problem is it was in legislative history and not in the statute and under a, a version of statute of construction that a, a, a number of judges subscribe to. What's said in legislative history by a particular senator or congressperson is irrelevant. You look at the language itself and you stop there. So to answer your question, to fix this, you would make that statement in legislative history very clear and part of the text itself. But even after that, we still have to deal with the non-delegation problem. If we left the language as broad as it was in that first sentence, and all we did was change it to say, and we're making really clear the second sentence is a constraint, it expands, we face a non-delegation risk because there are judges and there could be a majority in the Supreme Court who would say that is an unconstitutional delegation of legislative power to a federal agency. So that's where I recommend that folks should consider any some more specific language in conjunction with the CDC to think about what things they could foresee uh, as uh, tools they need in adding that to the language so it survives a non-delegation ch constitutional challenge. Interesting. Lonnie. <clears throat> well, thanks very much. That's really a nice summary and we appreciate that. Uh, my question would be this really today we're talking about the actions of the CDC director, but we know the implementation involves a very complex network of multiple agencies and actors. So, so how might this constrain or not constrain Homeland Security, USDA, TSA, uh, you know, and how does that play out uh, beyond CDC? Look, that, that's a fantastic question. And you're absolutely correct. With all these, like from cruise ships, contact tracing to other these actions, there is a very robust interagency process that I participated in involving all these other agencies that I described at the beginning. But at the end of the day, if the action is taken pursuant <laughs> to CDC regulatory power, it doesn't matter who's carrying it out. That action will rise and fall based on the constitutionality or the legal, otherwise the legality of the action taken under that statute. Interesting. 
Other questions? Michelle, and then Stephen again. Thank you very much, um, Will. In, in short, can you um, summarize the um, clearest way to go forward? Yes. Be as narrow, targeted, and limited in duration as possible as things currently stand when taking regulatory action under this statute. That's number one. Number two, if CDC were to go back to Congress as part of lessons learned from this pandemic and ask for broader authority, clearly in the statute, because a pandemic re requires that type of breadth and flexibility, it needs to consider adding more specific language than currently exists in the first sentence of this statute. Otherwise, that new statute might be struck down on non-delegation grounds and CDC may end up with less power than it had before. Those are the two takeaways. Thank you. Stephen. Yeah, just in follow-up to that, um, you know, we heard yesterday from uh, a number of the cruise lines who expressed considerable dismay about the you know, blanket uh, no sale order uh, and the duration of that no sale order and the fact that they felt that they were singled out in the way that other types of transportation were not. Is that the type of thing that you think that they were on pretty firm ground being able to do or is that the type of thing that in the future could be questioned? Well, look, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be very sensitive about attorney-client privilege and since I've worked on some of these issues, but I will point you to the, uh, there's a district court decision out of the Middle District of Florida that addresses all these issues I discussed with respect to the conditional sale order. And at least according to that federal judge, that he believed that the state of Florida was on firm ground in challenging the conditional sale order. And the views that he expressed in that opinion were reflected in the decision of the Sixth Circuit in striking down the CDC's eviction moratorium order, as well as by some in the Supreme Court in the sixth judge this majority. Let, let me ask a, a different kind of question, maybe getting to that in a different way. Um, one, of the, one of the arguments was um, that the CDC really doesn't have regulations um, to support that authority. Are, is, is, are there detailed regulations that have been promulgated through the regulatory process on how you uh, oversee and process um, you know, the various modes of transportation? Clearly, but let's focus first on shifts because we know that's a specific authority that, that the agency has. Yeah, there, there is a, a number of regulations that deal with carriers such as uh, ships, uh, control free practique, and uh, uh, other regulations found in 42 CFR 70 and, and 71. The issue is that at least according to the courts that have reviewed the regulations as well, you know, regulations, you, you, one only gets to the regulations if you first look at the statute and say the statute would authorize a scope of regulatory action that has been taken, right? And the court stopped right there and said, the statute doesn't even authorize statu uh, regulations of this breadth. Then in their alternative, some of these courts look at the regulations and said, even under the regulations as promulgated, they are not broad enough uh, or, or with specifics, uh, or they're not sufficient to cover the specific actions that were taken in these cases, which was the four phase conditional sale order, uh, which was just decided by one district court, as well as the eviction moratorium cases. And again, I, need, I want to emphasize that it was a very mixed decision. We have two circuit courts going in completely opposite directions and the Supreme Court splitting right down that line. Michelle, are you still, you have another question? If not, Marcy? Yeah, hi. Um, 
I'm actually speaking more from, I work with the New York City Health Department for over 30 years and I'm um, and dealt a lot with um, both individual and then large scale issues um, coordinating with the JFK quarantine station. And maybe you address this and I missed it, but the um, all the challenge, uh, challenging sort of operational issues that come up in uh, enforcing a federal quarantine order between the federal, you know, if, if a decision is made that quarantine is needed, but it's sort of operationalized by state or local jurisdictions. And if you feel there's a way to address that um, through um, language and the uh, in the legal language that you just shared with that with us. Fantastic question. Um, you know, in the OSHA decision, the Supreme Court, when they answer the question of who decides, uh, the answer, at least according to some of the justices, uh, were state and Congress, right? That, that expression is also reflected in some of the other decisions that limited CDC's authority, which it pointed to federalism. The idea that certain things are in the providence of state and local authorities, and it, it has to take a lot to disturb that balance. Historically, the federal government didn't regulate landlord-tenant relationships. Now, one could respond, and they have responded. This isn't just a landlord-tenant relationship. This is an unprecedented event that the science proves is interstate global, right? So to characterize it just as landlord-tenant relationship is to not capture the full picture. That is one argument, you know, that that's made. But I'm going to tell you where, where the law stands. The current Supreme Court will likely see a lot of these issues, what you're talking about, as primarily a state and local function. And with that in mind, you know, it would behoove the federal agencies to whenever possible work through and in collaboration with their state counterparts, which I know they do by providing expertise and support. And that would certainly uh, reduce the legal risk that such actions would be challenged successfully before the federal courts. Mommy. You're muted, Mommy. Yeah, thanks. Yesterday we were uh, discussing some of these issues with the World Health Organization. So uh, who, where does the authority with uh, international health regulations reside with vis-a-vis -vis federal regulations for global pandemics? Well, that, that is quite a complicated question. Um, there's a number of potential places where that authority could be found. It also depends on what type of actions are being taken. For example, uh, the CDC st statutory and regulatory authorities were used on incoming testing orders. For example, the ones that were issued, I believe it was in December of 2020 with the alpha variant to require testing before uh, individuals can fly back to the United States uh, from various parts of the world. And of course, the 212F orders were actually relied on Department of Homeland Security authorities under uh, the INA. So there is, there's no one single answer to this. It depends on the if, a specific issue that we're looking at when it comes to international uh, actions with international implications on preventing the introduction of COVID. Hi, thank you. This is George's Benjamin. Um, is this, this authority that CDC has as, a, as an agency, is it limited to infectious diseases or health <laughs> risks, other health risks that cross borders? It's limited to communicable diseases and there is, there is a body authority that lists them. I remember this quite well because we had to make sure that COVID would fall into the definition of a communicable disease. Okay, that was helpful. Other questions? Anna. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, in addition to your take home points, would you also add that um, Regulations should be as um, should be a, um, as least restrictive as possible. In addition to being time limited whenever possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the idea. You know, when the Supreme Court uses the word direct targeting of the disease itself and contrasts that 
with actions that will have an indirect or a downstream connection to mitigating and controlling the spread of the disease. I think that's exactly what it's getting to. And I think there is a sliding scale test here, right? I mean, it could be borne out from decisions. The larger the impact, that's duration, scope, financial impact, which the courts all looked at here, the more likely, the tighter the connection the courts would probably require. In fact, when we look at the major questions doctrine, it is actually couched in those terms. We expect Congress to speak really clearly when it comes to actions that could have vast political and economic impacts. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brad, uh, we'll take Brad. I think that's probably our last question. Thanks, Georges. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation today. I, I'm curious, yesterday we heard from Stephen Hoffman, uh, who's briefing us about the international health regulations and uh, particularly around border restrictions. And he, he made the statement that uh, most of the border restrictions in, implemented around the world, I think including the ones in the United States were illegal. Um, I understand that they may not have been completely compliant with IHR. Did, could you opine on the legality of uh, border restrictions vis-a-vis -vis the IHRs? Uh, no. Uh, that's not within my area of expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we probably need to make sure we get you on the Supreme Court. Thank you. <laughs> well, it was good to hear from you today. Um, good luck to you in your, your private practice career. And it was great, uh, great hearing from you. Thank you all. All right. Um, I like, I'd now like to introduce uh, Mr. Glenn Cohen. Um, Glenn is a deputy dean and professor of law uh, at the Harvard Law School. Glenn, thanks for being here today. Thank you very much. I'm just going to make sure that everybody can hear me okay. That sounds good. And let me just use share screen. If for some reason you can't see my PowerPoints, let me know. They're not very interesting. I'm a lawyer. We don't usually use a lot of PowerPoints, but give you something to look at rather than me. All you right. So you. You're good. Great. Great, so let me start by just starting some disclosures, always good. Uh, here are the things I should probably disclose. All right, here is the central question I think you'd like me to answer, which is how much does existing privacy law in the US restrict things like location apps, contact tracing, requiring airlines to collect and share information? The short answer is, very little restrictions. I'm going to give you the slightly longer answer, but it may just be for your purposes. The short answer is good enough, and we can explore this more in the Q&A beyond the longer answer I'm going to give you. But here's the longer answer. Uh, when you start with HIPAA, right, HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, HIPAA, probably one of the most misunderstood laws in the United States, often given as a five-letter word, but more like a four-letter word as an answer as to why somebody will not do something, right? It turns out it covers actually fairly small swaths of information sharing on healthcare providers. Uh, so let me start by just starting with the first restriction. In general, the privacy regulations, the privacy rule of HIPAA requires covered entities to maintain confidentialities of a defined type of protected health information what we call PHI. Now, covered entities are actually a fairly narrow set of individuals. They are health insurers, claim processing clearinghouse, healthcare providers, those are the main type. Those entities under the law have to adopt internal procedures to protect the privacy of protected health information. They have to train employees, have a privacy officer, secure patient records, and establish enforced agreements with third parties called business associates. That's the second ring. The High Tech Act of 2009 expanded the reach of HIPAA beyond covered entities, which are very narrow, to a slightly larger ring of business associates, which is defined under the statute as a person defined to include various organizations and businesses who is not an employee of a covered entity, but, quote, creates, receives, maintains, or transmits protected health information for a function or activity, including claims processing or administration, or provides services such as legal, accounting, or management services, unquote. So the first question you always ask is, are you a covered entity? If not, are you a business associate? If you're neither of those two things, HIPAA really doesn't apply to you. 
even if you are a covered entity or a business associate, it only applies to protected health information, PHI. Health information is defined as uh, oral or recorded information, including genetic information, created or received by a healthcare provider or a set of other entities that relates to the past, present, or future physical or mental health or condition of an individual, the provision of healthcare to an individual, or the past, present, or future payment for the provision of healthcare to an individual. And the, uh, the rule, though, only applies to protected health information, which is health information that is individually identifiable and held or transmitted in electronic media. All right. So the first thing to ask yourself, am I a covered entity? If no, stop. Am I a business associate of a covered entity? If no, stop. Is this protected health information? If no, stop. So only if you're either a covered entity or a business associate and you're talking about protected health information, are we even in the HIPAA zone? All right. Now, if we're in the HIPAA zone, <clears throat> turns out there's a widespread set of exceptions. I'm just going to tell you about one of the exceptions related to public health, which is the most relevant to you. And the default rule of HIPAA is that you need authorization from a patient. People often say consent. That's actually incorrect. It's authorization. But there are lots of exceptions. And one of these is for public health uses. And here again, I'm quoting from the statute. I'm happy to send you all these uh, the, the documents and the quotations, so you can just listen to me for now. Uh, permitted uses and disclosures. A covered entity may use or disclose protected health information for public health activities and purposes described in this paragraph two. One, a public health authority that is authorized by law to collect or receive such information for the purpose of preventing or controlling disease, injury, or disability, including but not limited to the reporting of disease, injury, vital events such as birth or death, the conduct of public health surveillance, public health investigations, public health interventions, or at the direction of a public health authority to an official or government agency that is acting in collaboration with a public health authority, including a foreign government. And then the statute goes on, for a person who may have been exposed to communicable disease or may otherwise be at risk of contracting or spreading a disease or condition, if the covered entity or public health authority is authorized by law to notify such person as necessary in the conduct of public health intervention or investigation. Those are very broad exceptions. So even if you fall within the ambit of HIPAA, there is a broad exception for the kind of stuff you likely want to do. But wait, there's more. This is like the Ginsu knife, right? Let me just show you. HHS during COVID went further just to make sure nobody is confused about this and issued several guidances and bulletin. I'm just gonna mention a couple of things from these. One is from 2020, and it begins with the following question. Does HIPAA allow a covered entity to share the name or other identifying information of an individual who has been infected with or exposed to the virus, SARS-CoV-2, or the disease caused by the virus, coronavirus disease 2019, with law enforcement, paramedics, other first responders, and public health authorities without an individual's authorization? And the answer is affirmatively, absolutely yes. You can notify a public health authority in order to prevent or control spread of disease. For example, HIPAA permits a covered entity to disclose PHI to a public health authority, such as the CDC, state, tribal, local, territorial public health departments, that is authorized by law to collect or receive PHI for the purpose of preventing or controlling disease, injury, disability, public health surveillance, public health investigations, public health interventions, unquote. A further bulletin just went further, just made this completely clear that a covered entity may disclose to the CDC protected health information on an ongoing basis as needed to report all prior and prospective cases of patients exposed to or suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19 and at the direction of a public health authority to a foreign government agency that is acting in collaboration with the public health authority. And again, to persons at risk of contracting or spreading a disease or condition, dot, dot, dot. So here HHS is just saying, everything we've said in general in the statute, we're gonna be absolutely clear that this applies to COVID-19. The conclusion is if Congress, if FAA, CDC were via lawful means, a statute of federal regulation within the ambits of an agency, require sharing of information of a particular kind or authorizing the public health agency, there's nothing in HIPAA that stands in the way. Okay. Now. I was specifically asked to talk a little bit about 
contact tracing and what are sometimes called contract tracing digital apps, although Professor Gostin and I, I think both prefer the term uh, digital exposure notification. And the reason why we prefer this is I'll tell you in a second. But what I wanna emphasize is HIPAA is a floor, not a ceiling. Individual states could demand more. For the most part, they haven't. HIPAA actually preempts lower protective state regulations, but not higher protective state regulations. Um, but you know, you might say, even if HIPAA allows me to do this, is it really a good idea to do this or not? What are the ethical considerations or the policy considerations that I should think about? So uh, contact tracing, of course, very old goes back a thousand, not thousands, but hundreds of years, let's just say. Uh, starts with syphilis, among other places, very prominent in the HIV epidemic. What we saw in COVID-19 was an attempt at automating surveillance called digital contact tracing by some. Uh, we prefer, I think, exposure notification. And the reason is because this is not doing what contact tracing does. It's not calling up people. It's not asking them who are your contacts. It's not figuring out what the exposure window is. Instead, what these do is essentially they uh, enable phones to have what are called chirps. And believe it or not, that is a technical term. That when your phone is close enough to another phone that has this enabled, essentially it'll keep a record. And if you later notify a public health authority of a positive test, it'll then go back. It'll figure out how many people you were in chirping range for the requisite period of time uh, during uh, your infectivity period and it will alert them if they've opted in. Now, that's a lot of steps involved. And in fact, there's a lot of ways in which I think these have underperformed and we can talk a little bit about why that is. But I wanna emphasize that the track record for this is very different from the track record of contact tracing. Now, this is a very busy slide, apologies for that. You don't need to stare at it too long. So I'm just gonna tell you what the big takeaway is. This is from a paper Professor Gostian and I did now, a little bit out of date because it's from about a year ago. And overall, what you see is two contrasting approaches to this, to this mechanism of trying to use digital technologies in this way. There was a more centralized approach favored by governments in China, South Korea, Taiwan, and elsewhere, and a more decentralized user-centric approach supported by Apple and Google and favored in the United States among elsewhere. They have their pluses and minuses, one of the minuses of the system we largely have in place here in the United States is if you've got a notification of having been in chirping range, it's actually fairly hard to interpret what that means. You do not know how many people are in the network. You do not know, you know how long they have been in the network. And you're not given this kind of detailed information. And you as an individual, it's put on your shoulders to act. On the other hand, it's much more privacy protected than what we saw in China and elsewhere, where also, by the way, it's connected to social credit and some kinds of penalizations and access restrictions on individuals. That said, they are better able to use these technologies because of the centralization to map where outbreaks are happening on the local level in a way we are not able to do so. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this uh, in a moment. Maybe the last thing I'll say, and I'll just end my slide sharing, hopefully that worked, is just to say a slight bit about the ethical questions or how I see the ethical questions is really quickly here. And when you ask me, are these a good idea and how do they work? One of the main issues is uptake. There's a real trade-off between privacy autonomy on the one hand and effectiveness on the other. Even in places where we had high amounts of uptake, relatively speaking, they were not high enough to really make a dent using these technologies. So if you want to really make a dent using these technologies, something much stronger than voluntary downloading and voluntary opting in probably is going to be required. I think it's quite difficult in the current system for a user to understand the signal. I got one of these the other day and I stared at it for a little while and asked myself, what the heck should I be doing differently? How should my life change? given before five minutes ago when I didn't have the signal. And it was kind of a confusing set of questions to ask myself. I got an additional PCR that day I probably wouldn't have, but it's not so easy to translate this into public health action the way it is with much more direct manual contact tracing. And in privacy, even though these are much more privacy protective, there are some risks of sharing information. 
if you're with a family member who's largely been sequestered, except when they go jogging once, uh, you know, once a day, and suddenly you get a chirp, because of the way these things work and the amount of time they have to be in the proximity of someone, you might start asking yourself, what is my spouse doing during these jogging kinds of places? So we can reveal information, but that is true of contact tracing too. Contact tracing has always revealed information, not directly, but through induction in terms of, you know, who you're having sexual relations with and the like. And the last thing I just want to say is about function creep. And this, I think, is the thing that is the most concerning here. It is relatively easy once the system is installed to use it for different kinds of functions. And we saw this in places like Singapore where actually police were given access to some of this data. And you could easily rig something like this up for known gang members, for example, to say whenever they're in proximity with one another, I'm gonna have that chirp and that system, that notification. So when these things are put into place, it's extremely important that there be good civil society and legal protections against function creep in areas like immigration and law enforcement, which is part of what I think dissuades some people from adopting it. Okay, lots more to say, but let me stop there. I'm looking forward to chatting more with you. Excellent, excellent. Um, questions, Brad, your hands up. I'm not sure that's from your last um, speaker. It is. Wow. Well, I can. <clears throat> Thanks, Larry. No, I mean, I would just, it's a great presentation, Glenn. I think the the absence of questions was really because of the clarity and and how erudite the, the presentation was. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, beyond HIPAA and contact tracing, suppose, you know, are, are committees charged with, kind of um, issues at the border. Um, and we, you know, it's so it might well be that you have, you, you have to, re you're, you're required to be, um, to, to show a, a negative test, for example, to, you might be required to, to um, be vaccinated, or you could imagine that in future it would, it could be tuberculosis or, um, uh, sec, you know, whatever the disease might be. Um, so are there any, any legal or privacy concerns that we should have when we seek to expand, if we do, um, CDC's powers um, to require information for, um, for protection? And that, I, you know, that would mostly be at the border, which I know gives expandix expanded uh, uh, rights and powers, but it, you know, potentially in the future, it might even be in an interstate commerce, um, you know, get on a plane and have to show a negative test to fly to Florida, for example. Um, uh, so, uh, and so it's not just COVID, it's future things. I just wondered if you could reflect on that. Yeah, so I think uh, implicit in Professor Gostin's question is the realization that power of the federal government is at its zenith at the border, right? We have long historical uh, cases of boats being turned away, for example, uh, yellow fever and stuff like that. And the right to international travel as a right, even by U.S. citizens, is of much less uh, certain constitutional provenance than the right to interstate travel. So that's just to say that I think if we're starting at where you're going to have any legal problems at all, the interstate case is probably higher than the international case. The problems that I foresee are not particularly in privacy law. <clears throat> if they're anywhere, they're about impeding people from traveling itself, however you got the information. So even if you didn't ask the question, if someone were to you know, shout to high heaven and tell you this, and your rule is, hey, I'm not gonna let you do this. However, I know this information, you volunteered the information I didn't even ask. That's the rule where I think with interstate travel, <clears throat> There may be some pushback. And there actually have been uh, cases involving, among other things, uh, it sounds a little different, the no-fly list. And I know this more with my civil procedure hat on, which I, I teach rather than my health law hat on, where, for example, there were due process challenges to uh, the maintenance of the no-fly list relating to terrorism. 
And, you know, the uh, people, there had to be a system by which people could request to be removed, to be reviewed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the recent events with Jovovic in uh, Australia are an interesting example of the kind of thing that I would think about. Uh, so imagine somebody were to say, well, actually, I don't have vaccination, but I have natural immunity. And by the way, yesterday, CDC just released something suggesting natural immunity is pretty good. Uh, it is unconstitutional for you to draw this distinction between people who are fully vaccinated and me who is immune. To have a system in place to review those claims, also questions of fraudulence and counterfeit and how that is reviewed, that if the border officer determines that a letter or something like that approved is actually fraudulent. Uh, you know, in the international co context, and I can tell you this, having been a Canadian who's been stopped at the border a few times and put in secondary, we have lots of instances where, in fact, they do detain you and there is process. In the interstate context, much less so in terms of what we do. We don't typically have uh, border kind of control interstate. So I'd be worried about those things far before I'd be worried about the privacy uh, side of it. And I'll just say one more thing, which is there are ways of treating information about whether you satisfy a requirement that might not even be protected health information. So if you ask somebody follow-up questions, uh, you know, do you, you know, why, why couldn't you be vaccinated and the like, okay, now we're getting into the protected health information. But there may be ways of creating certification of vaccination that even don't even creep into health because they're merely telling us you're okay. And we're not gonna ask whether you're okay because of natural immunity, because you have an accommodation, because of vaccination. I don't need to ask those follow-up questions that might be desirable. Thank you, Glenn. Stephen. Stephen. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. That was a wonderful presentation. How about, uh, what's, your, what's your thought in terms of the use of some of these technologies not necessarily for things like contact tracing, but to uh, be able to monitor compliance with uh, required interventions such as isolation, quarantine uh, of individuals coming into the country. Good question. I, I'll say I've thought less about this. Um, one thing I'll tell you is there's a history with direct observational therapy, for example, in the tuberculosis case, where in fact we are able to kind of require it. Now that though follows on a judicial order for, or for the like, right, where somebody has been non-compliant um, to begin with. You, if you're talking about somebody who you know is positive, for example, and you are saying, can I monitor that you do not leave this 10 block radius? Now you're talking about geolocation information. It's not covered by HIPAA because it's not protected health information at all. As a governmental entity, chances are some of the state privacy laws like California's privacy law and the new Virginia one that's coming on board, my sense is that you would probably fall into the exceptions for those. So I think you would also be on strong footing if you were retaining location data uh, or the like. Now there does though get to a point where we might encounter a fourth amendment set of questions about criminal investigation. So imagine I were to say it is an offense to leave your house or 10 blocks from your house when you've turned uh, positive. And as a result, I want to now uh, trace, you know, your phone or an ankle bracelet or something like that. Now, I think there are questions about whether uh, you run into a Fourth Amendment question, whether there ought to be a warrant requirement or an exception to the warrant requirement. There are exceptions to the warrant requirement. So there are cases regarding actually stops for intoxicated drivers where the Supreme Court has said you're allowed to have those without even reasonable suspicion because you're seeking to, to not to enforce a law enforcement purpose. You have this other purpose of deterring drunk driving. And perhaps you could use that here too. But I would think that you'd want a little bit more criminal investigations, criminal law, Fourth Amendment kind of advice here on how you do that. It could be a condition of entering the country. So sometimes for probation, for example, we have people waive many of their Fourth Amendment rights. I don't know in the immigration context whether we've done that as well for some kinds of searches and seizures, but that would be the line of thought I would, I would probably go on more than the health privacy stuff. Jason. Jean. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, 
let's say a person is entering the United States and, and you ask them to download an app for exposure notification. And then they, they, they stop by San Francisco and they transfer uh, their flight and they go to rally. North Carolina, and and now uh, you, you you're crossing two states. Now they they officially landed in San Francisco, clear customs. Now they're on their way to rally. Now uh, is that does that pose any any uh, legal authority issues in terms of now it's in the state's uh, jurisdiction when you try to do contact tracing or exposure notification or or can you continue that line? Is is because this person is entering the United States? that you're, you're, you're tracking them? Great question. I'm gonna give a very lawyerly answer, which, which is it depends. And here's what it depends on, I think, right? If the federal government is to put forward a uh, exposure notification app that requires everybody to use it and the federal government owns it, essentially very little problem. What we've seen with the current exposure notification apps as I understand it, is individual states decided to partner or not partner and to involve their public health uh, authorities. And some at least try to, I think, make alterations or make changes. I think they've all, all decided their own criteria for what counts as a notifiable event. But some, I think, have tried to negotiate regarding certain privacy requirements or stuff like that. And some might be even using different apps. The moment you end up in that space, if that's what the world persists to look like, you run into a couple of problems. One is you might enter a dead zone if North Carolina, for example, decides not to participate at all, when the person leaves California, there may be no sharing of information uh, with uh, authorities. The other is it's not a dead zone, but in fact, the states don't coordinate between themselves in terms of notification. So when the person gets back to San Francisco, there's no notification that actually they had a positive result here. So this is, I think, a strong argument as to uh, why, you know, you, the idea would be the federal government owning and administering it. If not, I think the next best is some kind of idea of interstate compact or agreement between the states, which could, you know, you can get very fancy here. Probably if you're looking to build an infrastructure for the next 20 years, you want to get fancy. And this is what fancy looks like, would be like a model law done by the uniform uh, legal commissioners or the like that could be passed in the exact same way in each of the states or an interstate compact. If you're not getting that fancy, it might just be a question of getting the attorney generals of various states or the departments of health together and getting a network of people who are opting in. But both of those are much more complicated than if the federal government merely owns this and administers it nationwide. So, so suppose CDC were to do this, uh, a federal agency, that will be something that is easier than trying to get all the states to sign on the same document. It is. What you're it is. Um, here's just one thing I would look out for, right? If you're talking about CDC doing it through its existing agency powers, as opposed to an act of Congress doing it, you may mm -hmm. run into questions about whether if there is conflicting state law, this, the, the mandate to CDC is sufficiently clear and broad to preempt the conflicting state law in this area. And again, if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have been more confident that the courts would say, of course, CDC can do this. But the last you know, six months, during the last couple of weeks, has made me a little bit more suspicious about the court's attitudes towards agency powers and public health, such that something that was a little clearer from Congress, the statutory authorization would be even better. Thank you. Steven, your hands up. Is that um, from the last time or is that a new one? Um, Bradley had a comment in the chat, and I just want to amplify this, that I think that oh. this is uh, a fair comment by, by, by Bradley, that the idea here about um, when it comes to constitutional claims, but also other legal claims, uh, our constitution is not always as protective of different categories of individuals. And certainly uh, non-citizens get the least constitutional protection. Now, there is an interesting question about the territorial scope of the constitutional protections once you're in the country, but it is true that we might have different kinds of claims by different kinds of people. I think that's well said, Bradley. All right. Any other questions? All right. 
Glenn, that was an absolutely amazing presentation. Very clear, very much on point. Um, very, very helpful. I have to admit when I was um, practicing as a state health official, um, this whole issue of HIPAA was always frustrating because uh, um, you're right, everybody uses it for their own purposes and that opt out for public health is not well, really well understood. So I think that's one of the things we've got to spend a little bit of time on as a, as a field. So I thank you. Um, and uh, uh, George, so, sorry, um, I know you're about to sign off, but may I ask just a really quick question? Oh, please do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks, Anna. And, and thank you for your presentation. Really appreciated it. Um, we heard from a speaker yesterday from the airline industry who indicated um, one of their own frustrations was that they could not share or perhaps there wasn't a mechanism in place for sharing do not fly lists for passengers who misbehave, shall we say, on airlines, refusing to wear masks, creating threatening situations. Um, does that fall under any, uh, can you comment on that and what can be done on that? Yeah, so I can, I can definitely speculate, and here's my speculation. The first reason they want, don't want to do it is probably because, you know, sharing it, although there's some advantage to sharing it, there's also a concern that when a passenger tries to board another flight, another airline, and says, why can't I board? And says, well, we were told you were an unruly passenger, that they will get sued by that passenger about sharing that information, the first airline that will do so. We actually see, oddly, a similar um, reluctance in sharing uh, when someone's fired, especially when fired for something like sexual harassment, for an employer sharing that with the next employer down the road. Now, probably they overestimate what their legal liability is because it's a truthful statement about what the information is. There's no reason to think uh, it violates the law to share that information. But my sense is that they may just have a desire not to get embroiled in that. If there was a specific law that they think is preventing them, I'd be curious to hear what it is, but nothing kind of jumps to my mind to say, oh, well, actually the law prohibits you sharing that information. It is, you know, truthful information about an individual. Uh, you know, you might get sued for defamation, but your defense is, well, actually it was truthful. Could, this is George, could they share that with CDC? Uh, and could CDC compile such a list and then um, share that with the other airlines? You know, I think that, that I see even less of an obstacle for them doing that kind of sharing because as a governmental entity, you have much more, CDC has much more protection and immunity. The thing to consider now, here's the one place where it's slightly more complicated when CDC is involved. Now you have a state actor such that uh, the due process clause of the constitution among others gets involved and an individual might say, okay, well, I've been put on your no-fly list. I wanna contest these allegations. How do I go about doing that? And if CDC is holding the information and holds the master list, I think you need to think a little bit about what process you'd want to give. And the terrorism no-fly list, uh, they gave very little process to be very frank about this, and they got sued in a series of cases. I think it's ended up at an okay place, but it'd be the kind of thing where I think I would recommend some conversation with Homeland Security to understand a little bit more about where they've ended up with their anti-terrorism no-fly list. Now there, there's additional complication that many of the allegations that put someone's on the no-fly list are non-public, so that you can't even say on such and such a date you've done enough because they don't want to reveal uh, information about how they uh, record people and, and the like. That's probably not a concern in this context. But I would have a look at where Homeland Security has ended up after being sued on this question. Yeah, I remind the Senator Edward Kennedy ended up on that list just because the name was similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the. Um... So let me just see if I understand it correctly. Um, I think the airline could share it with a federal agency, but what if it wasn't CDC? What if they were sharing, the airline was sharing it with Homeland Security or, or, or FAA, and they were the ones that did the no-fly list? It, um, because there are two kinds of things that could happen to put you on a no-fly list. One is, is that you fail to comply with a federal order a lawful federal order like um, you, you refuse to mask. Um, or the other one might be that um, 
uh, you you you're violent about it, um, and you're disruptive. And in both cases, the the airline itself will put you on its no fly list. So the question that you know George's is raising is about the having a national um, uh, no fly list, and the national no fly list could I assume would probably be at the FAA, could be at the CDC, could be at the FAA, could be at the um, uh, at Homeland Security. Um, does it matter where it lies, who has jurisdiction? And then no matter where, it, and could the airline share it with a non-public health agency, a security agency or, or an airline a regulatory agency, number one. And then number two, I assume that the process for challenging your inclusion on that list would have to be a reasonable one. Um, I think that's exactly right. And so the, about the challenging, absolutely exactly the same. I think because you're not talking about health information, right, the information about you refuse to mask or you are unruly, right, neither of those are information about your health. You're not in the ambit of HIPAA as a result, such that there's no reason to think it has to be shared only with a public health agency. I don't see anything that would say that it has to be at CDC rather than FAA or Homeland uh, Security. Another way of putting it is, if you had unruly passengers who were unruly for reasons completely unrelated to COVID-19, it would seem as though that's a reason to put somebody on a no-fly list, no matter what the motivation for being unruly is. And it would be strange to put all of those people on a list maintained by CDC. You think you should just have a general unruly passenger list. And there have been instances, so I, I, I can't remember this, uh, there was uh, maybe two years ago, somebody who was fairly violent on a plane and was reported being fairly violent on a plane. And I don't know exactly what happened. The person was definitely banned for life from that airline. I would be surprised if they're flying on other airlines and it would be interesting to find out exactly what the process- We, we were uh, told that they are flying on oh, other airlines. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting too. I mean, you know, the, the, maybe there's some instances of mental health where the information again looks more like HIPAA protected and maybe a public health agency is more important. Although you might think in administering this program, even though FAA is not ordinarily a public health agency, it is acting within a public health sphere. So you'd have to look carefully at the language of HIPAA to see whether it falls in or not, or a subdelegation from CDC back to them or a joint CDC, Homeland Security, FAA list, for example, there might be ways of doing this. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Glenn. Um, Brad, did you have something before we go? Yeah, so I was, I was just going to comment on and, and actually bring back some an earlier presentation that we had. But so um, from my years at DHS, I know that we so we do have a, a no fly list, which uh, which, uh, as Glenn talked about, is, is a, basically a, a terrorism no fly list. But uh, as another thing that we that in TSA administers that no fly list and the airlines uh, use a thing called secure flight to make sure that people that are on that flight, don't fly list don't get on, on an airplane. But there's also, um, as CDC presented earlier, the do not board list. And so these are for folks who are public, uh, uh, meet some criteria of a, of a risk to public health and non-compliant and can go on there. And, uh, and they're also denied boarding uh, for an airline. We try to try to not use the same terms of no fly because you don't want someone who is a public health issue to be lumped in with the terrorist, but, uh, but there are on the do not board list. And there's a, a process to get people off the do not board list once they're put on and, and a system to do that. But uh, it's when uh, Delta talked about that yesterday, it was interesting that this is kind of another category of folks that are uh, not, uh, not a public health risk, but really a, a public nuisance and, but still non-compliant with some public health measures. So it could be that that would be a good, um, you know, something else that they could add um, to that list that's basically administered by the TSA. All right, folks, we, we really need to get to get uh, move on. Thank you very, very, very much. Appreciate it. And I think Marty put something in the uh, in the chat for us to review as well. All right. Um, again, Glenn, thank you very, very much. Um, so today's last speaker is from the CDC Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analysis uh, and Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security to discuss data and evaluation. Um, so actually, I think actually we've got Caitlin Rivers, who's the Deputy Director for the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analysis at CDC is actually our speaker today.
Caitlin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Caitlin Rivers, I'm Associate Director of the New Center. If you haven't heard of us, it's because we are brand new. Uh, we first came into being, at least in spirit, on President Biden's first full day of office when we appeared in the National Security Memo Number 1. Funding for our center came in the American Rescue Plan in March, and our founding leadership team started at CDC in August. And so we're just getting our feet under us, and I'm excited to tell you today a little bit about what we're planning and where we see our center going. So I have a few slides that I will walk through. Don't think I need to belabor it with this group, but disease outbreaks are a frequent and disruptive problem. And it's not just the COVID pandemic, it's also Zika, it's Ebola, it's H1N1 and on and on. And that's on top of the seasonal respiratory viruses that perpetually haunt us. And over the years, as these outbreaks have, have continued to make themselves apparent, the appetite for data and analytics to support that response has only grown. And so our center is helping to fit some, uh, meet some of those needs and fill in some of those gaps. Now, I'd like to start by just giving you a crisp idea of the kinds of things that we expect to be able to help with when we are fully staffed. And I've curated these questions from recent congressional testimonies and the media just to make the point that they're top of mind for a lot of people. What's the probability of a winter surge? What degree of immune escape in a variant would cause a surge? How many tests might we need to support widespread diagnostic and screening testing? What role would vaccine availability for young children play in changing the epidemic's trajectory? And how would changing our pace of administering boosters alter the epidemic trajectory? These are all fundamentally modeling questions and are the kinds of things where we can see ourselves being useful. And if you zoom out a little bit and move focus away from the COVID pandemic, there's a lot we can do at every point in the life cycle of an outbreak. Early in an outbreak, uh, we can help with things like parameter estimation, risk assessment, how worried should we be about this new virus or new emergence? Where might we expect to see cases imported based on global travel patterns? Um, lots of questions early in an outbreak that can help us to understand what our posture should be. In the middle of an outbreak, you might be interested in questions like scenario analysis. What happens if? What if I were to implement these sets of interventions? How might I compare one set of interventions against another? Disease forecasting is something that is already starting to be a regular part of the way that we think about outbreaks. Uh, lots of things that uh, the questions really that we see now are, the, are those pertinent to the middle of an outbreak. And then at the end of an outbreak, if you get there, you might have questions about how to place um, enrollment sites for clinical trials to make sure that they're powered. That was a question that came up during the Ebola outbreak that modeling helped to support. You might have questions about how close you are to the end of an outbreak and what the probability of a resurgence is. And so all the way from the beginning to the end, there are modeling questions that our center will be able to help to support. What we're not doing, just to say it explicitly, because we get a lot of questions, is predicting the emergence or the start of outbreaks. The science just isn't there yet. It might be something that we grow into as the science develops further, but right now we can't really say with any confidence where, where a new outbreak might start. And so that's not part of our priority set right now. So that's uh, the vision of what we hope to be able to do, what we're working towards. And I'll talk a little bit right now about how we plan to get there. We have four guiding principles, and the first is mission impact. We are not, I, I, now I'm starting to giggle when I say this because I say it every single time I, I give this slide, but we are not interested in writing keepers. We are not interested in admiring the problem. We're really interested in helping to support public health practice and helping to support the response. And that's really the way that we're orienting all of our work. We are also committed to being open and transparent. Um, we have seen through the pandemic and, and outbreaks all the time, really, that it's not just who we think of as decision makers that are making decisions. It's not just the CDC director or federal leaders or even governors or state health leaders. It's actually the members of the school board, it's business owners, it's parents and families. And the best way to help to support all of those decision makers broadly defined, we think, is to make our work as open and transparent as possible. We are also committed to being collaborative. There are a lot of new efforts similar to ours that are in the works. The UK has the pandemic radar, WHO has the new Berlin hub. There are several foundation focused efforts like at Rockefeller, for example, that are focused on similar problems. And we have all collectively committed to making sure that each of those is greater than the sum of its parts. And so we meet with each of those stakeholders at least monthly, if not more, to make sure that we're all pulling in the right, right direction. And we are also committed to being equity fo focused and to make sure that we are always incorporating an eye towards health disparities in our, in our models, in our analyses, and that we're considering how disparate impacts of outbreaks and underlying structural inequities 
may play into the outcomes that we are modeling and also communicating about those models. We are organizing our program into three major functions. The first is what we're calling predict. And this will be the analytical engine of the analyses that we will produce. It will be staffed by computational epidemiologists, by modelers, by data scientists, and it will really be about turning the crank to produce the models and analyses to support response efforts. And we see a big role for um, supporting, focusing our analysis on state, tribal, territorial, and local leaders, as well as uh, the federal leaders who you generally think of when you think of um, efforts situated in the federal government. We have further uh, identified a few priority functions within our predict team, and they're kind of categorized into three major groups. The first is parameter estimates. And it used to be that we would, uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it used to be that we would think of parameter estimates as kind of a one-time thing. The incubation period is this, the serial interval is that, the reproduction number is that. And we've seen actually that you need to be continually revising and updating those estimates as new information comes in, as new variants emerge, as the virus reaches new populations. And so one of our teams will be focused on parameter estimation. We will also have a team focused on producing scenarios and forecasts. Oh, Siri wishes to participate. There we go. Um, a group focused on producing scenarios and forecasts. Uh, and this can range anything from a forecast where we say this is what we think will happen in two weeks to more notional planning questions like what do the good, bad, and worst scenarios look like and how can we bound the range of expected or um, um, even imagined future outcomes. And we are also planning a, a function that we are calling targeted studies. And this is really focused on going out and collecting the data that we need to understand what is happening with an outbreak and to inform the models. And I have a good example of how we've already done this later in the presentation, but this is really about going out and collecting the data that can help us to answer key questions that are always popping up in an outbreak. Our second function is, I think, a little bit innovative. It's um, something that we're proud of. It's called Inform. And this is basically around communication. I think we're devoting an entire one third of our operations to communication because we've seen how important it is in a pandemic or, or in an outbreak, an event of any scale. And these will be experts in communication who also have a deep fluency in modeling and computational epidemiology. And their job will be to reach decision makers. We will have people assigned to the federal government, We'll have people assigned to STLT, we'll have even a group assigned to the public, and they will be basically briefing out results from our PREDICT team. But I want to point out that we also really see this as a two-way street. It's not just about pushing out insights, it's also about asking for priorities. We'll be asking what questions are you facing right now, what information or analyses would help you to make those decisions, what can we do to help to support you, and so it's really about a relationship to make sure that the insights that our predict team are generating are really well connected to the decision making cycle. And our third and final major function is called inform and this is about research and development. It's about investing in uh, constantly advancing the state of the science so that we can always be improving our models, improving our performance. And we will do this in partnership with our academic colleagues. We're, we already have a robust academic network thanks to the long history of modeling at CDC that even predated us. Um, we'll also be partnering with the private sector and across the interagency to make sure that we always have the cutting edge really brought into the program and ready to bring to bear for outbreak response. Now, one question that we get a lot or one um, kind of assumption that people have about our program is that we have a large remit around data. And so I just want to point out that CDC also has a program called DMI or the Data Modernization Initiative that is really tasked with advancing the public health infrastructure at the state and local and federal levels. And so DMI really has the lead on making sure that our public health data infrastructure is modernized and fit for purpose. And we see ourselves as slightly further in the pipeline. We're really making use of that data and creating the kinds of models and analyses that can help to support outbreak response. So it's a, it's a really um, robust ecosystem and we're partnering really closely with the DMI folks to make sure that both initiatives are separate, but we are a little bit um, upstream, I guess, downstream from uh, the, the data piece with the exception of targeted studies, which is more of a strike team function. And I'll just close with a few words about some of the work that we have done to date. Again, our founding leadership team only started in August, um, but we have awarded around $26 million to academic and interagency groups. And the purpose of those awards are, I would say, threefold. 
The first is around improving forecasting and outbreak analytics. So I said that one of the goals for our innovate function is to make sure we always have the cutting science, cutting edge science, and that's uh, a priority that we have already invested in. We also have a suite of work around health equity, uh, both to better incorporate drivers and um, structural factors around health inequities into our models and also to improve the diversity of the model and workforce. And we have also entered into interagency agreements with the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation to make sure that we're leveraging resources that already exist across the interagency and making, making good use of what's already available to us. Uh, we are very much in planning mode. There's only a handful of us um, at the center right now. We're working on growing, but when the Omicron variant was first uh, brought to public awareness by our colleagues in South Africa, we knew we couldn't let the moment pass by without doing what we could to support. And so we sort of rolled up our sleeves and did what we could with the, the small but mighty team is what, how we like to phrase it. Um, and so here is a short list of the number of some of the ways that we've been able to contribute. We rallied around with our academic colleagues to get a look at what the Omicron variant would look like when it became established in the United States. And we saw that the situation was quite serious. And so we pivoted immediately to briefing senior leaders, the senior most people involved with COVID decision-making in the federal government, and basically told them that we should be prepared for a very large wave. And we did that as soon as early December. And I think that gave us a really important few week heads up in order to get our feet under us and start to prepare for the Omicron surge. We also help to inform the school test to stay guidance, which allows children who have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 to continue to attend school as long as they follow some testing protocol. We uh, provided some analysis that decision makers used to consider the updated quarantine and isolation guidance. Uh, shout out to Alex Vespignani, who I think is a committee member who was really instrumental in uh, responding to a direct request from the leadership to estimate the risk of importation of Omicron, not just in the very early days, but also as time passed and as Omicron became established in the United States. And that was used to help um, make decisions about whether and when to lift the travel restrictions that were in place through December. And more recently, we participated in producing some of the first US, US estimates of Omicron severity in partnership with academic colleagues. Um, and this is an example of what we think of when we think of targeted studies. There were a lot of questions or a lot of um, general understanding that Omicron was less severe than Delta, but we needed data to really have a clear sense of what the risk was. And so we partnered with Kaiser Permanente of Southern California and some academic colleagues to look and see what was happening in the United States. So we went out and collected the data that we needed to uh, really understand the Omicron variant in the United States. And this is my last slide, it comes from the National Weather Service and it's a look at forecast accuracy over time. 50, 70 years ago, we were absolutely terrible at weather forecasting, it was basically a guess. But after decades of investment in data, in models, in expertise, in computational power, sustained funding, of course, we were able to advance the state of weather forecasting to where we currently enjoy weather forecasts that are really quite accurate. Although I will say we had a snow day yesterday and it didn't snow, so I'm a little upset about that. But nonetheless, we have really gotten to a place where we don't even think about weather forecasts anymore. We just, we just rely on them as a default. And that's part of the lens we're taking with CFA. We have a lot that we want to do now with the resources and the expertise and the methods that we have available to us right now. But we're also looking 10, 20, 40 years out to say, where do we want to be and how can we push the envelope and push our capabilities in the model of the weather service? So I will leave it there and look forward to discussion. My colleague, um, Dr. Mark Lipsitch, who is our director for science, is also on the line to help to answer questions. Over. Thank you very much. Um, Jason. Yes, uh, Kaylin, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I, I was wondering, uh, you said that your group is, is just starting. And what's the current number of FTEs in the uh, in the CFA and, and what's the plan to expand this group? Uh, that's the first question. And, and then the second question is that given the variety of data that you are trying to uh, put together, what's, what's the, the, the current ETL process of, of getting these different types of data uh, so that you could use them? Uh, and, and what's the plan going forward? 
Yeah, we have about five FTEs right now and about three or four people who are on part-time detail to us. We are planning to grow to over a hundred. And so we have a lot, a lot of growth ahead of us, but for now it's just a, a little tiger team. And in terms of data, we are looking to the CDC programs that already have deep connections to existing data sources. To, and we're working all the time with the programs to make sure that we have those connections in place. The good news is that that's pretty much ready to go when we're, when we're ready to really start turning the crank. We have access to a lot of data and a lot of data resources. Um, and then uh, uh, the function related to targeted studies where we plan to go out and collect the data will take us a little bit longer because for that, we'll have to arrange a lot of the research networks that are not uh, in existence yet. The, the, the question is, is also uh, interoperability. Uh, between the different types of data and, and given the different standards uh, that's in use uh, and, and what's the plan to, to you know, convert all the data to common standard or, or at least uh, have the capability of, of extracting transformant load from different data sources. It must be quite a challenge trying to do that. Yeah, it's tough out there. That is actually in the, the arena of our data modernization initiative colleagues. So it's a, it's a set of problems that is a little bit outside of our scope, but I agree it's absolutely critical to get right to make sure that every all of the stakeholders are able to make the best and fullest use of those data. Thank you. I'm gonna go with Moon and then Warren um, and then Steven. Hi, thanks so much for your presentation. Other than for travel restrictions, what types of forecasting can be done to help control the impact at our borders um, regarding disease transmission? And then what types of data are you looking at and what types of data would you need for your forecasting? Thanks. Yeah, great question. And I'll ask Mark to chime in here after I say a few words. I'm glad that you have Alex on your committee because he is really a leader in the area of the relationship between travel and infectious diseases. And so we're, we definitely look to him for a lot of leadership in that area. Um, I think in terms of data, understanding international travel patterns is absolutely critical and even domestic travel patterns because that's a, a question, set of questions around where we can expect the geographic distribution of outbreaks domestically is also an interesting question. Uh, also, forecasting and risk assessment, which I think is a slightly less, um, a, a set of questions that's better suited when there is not so much data available, is a place that we anticipate being able to contribute when outbreaks have started abroad and we wish to understand the possible risk to the United States. Mark? Yeah, I, I think you said it well. I would just add that obviously short of restricting travel, there are a series of measures, including test requirements and uh, on entry test requirements on exit uh, and and so forth um, not to get into the whole question of of what happens at the border uh, when people are detained there which is a, a separate issue uh, that's perhaps not mainly a modeling issue um, but but one of the types of modeling uh, that we would certainly be particip involved in would be, asking those questions about, you know, when when does a test become, how soon before travel or after travel should testing be done to maximize effectiveness in, in uh, preventing introductions. Um, so there are uh, other things like that, um, as well as potentially in certain circumstances, uh, quarantine on, the, on entry. But that's, of course, another uh, big policy decision. Thank you. Warren. Uh, very exciting, a new center. Beyond, the, uh, beyond epidemiology, what kinds of skill sets are you uh, projecting and what are your plans to develop those extra expertises, if, if you will? Yeah, right now, I would say that many modelers are, they reside in academia and they may or may not have a lot of direct experience with public health practice. And so we see our predict team as being kind of an evolution of the expertise where, where our experts will be modelers and computational epidemiologists, but they'll also really have an opportunity to interface with public health practice. With our INFORM branch, we're really looking at communication. And those communicators need to have an understanding and expertise in modeling so that they can do the translation. But we do see it as a separate skill set whereby modelers are not always the right people to say or to communicate the results. 
Um, and so we're really developing communication as another set of expertise. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking. Oh, Mark, did, I'm sorry. Did you oh, want to Mark, add? did you have uh, a comment? No, I think, I think it, we, let's move on to the next question. I'll come back to Steven. it. Yeah, <clears throat> Caitlin, it's really good to see you. I actually have three questions. One of them is uh, this issue around transparency of your analyses. Uh, what, what are you going to do in a circumstance where your analysis clearly says uh, policy X or policy Y isn't a very good idea, and yet we go ahead and do it anyway for other reasons? And so what, what, what are you anticipating doing in those circumstances? The, the second is, is more of a sort of an internal structural uh, issue at CDC, which is that uh, I know, especially in the quarantine division, they've done lots of modeling over the years, and some of it has been really superb. And so is the idea of your center to be able to support efforts that go on elsewhere in the agency, or would you anticipate that other parts of the agency would bring, bring questions to you and that your center would actually be the ones that are doing this type of analysis? And then my third question is, um, you know, the proverbial issue of garbage in, garbage out. There are such incredible quality limitations in some of the data available right now in public health to be able to help inform your uh, modeling that um, it, it's a real challenge. One of the reasons that forecasting has gotten so much better in terms of the weather over the years is the quality of the information that's available to them. So how do you, how do you handle the data quality issues? Yeah, on the topic of transparency, we've thought about this a lot and it's going to be, we have to build this, but it's going to be our starting position to make as much open and transparent as possible. And that way it will be notable and there will be more friction when there is, if there were to ever to be a move to limit our insights because of, they publish every Monday. And so why aren't they publishing this Monday? It's really going to be our starting position to make things open and transparent. We have already started this actually with the, we published a, we originally phrased it the notification of significant findings, and I think I think it got retitled. But um, basically, we put out an alert that that said that we expect the Omicron surge to be severe in the United States, and published it on the CDC website. And I think that was a little bit of a new way of communicating, for, foreshadowing something to come. And that's the kind of product that we anticipate um, continuing to put out. In terms of other programs, we are not taking any staff or any existing modeling programs from their current homes. We are additive to the extent that programs that already have modeling infrastructure would like us to support and contribute. We are more than happy to do that, but we do not plan to relocate or rehome any existing uh, assets within the agency. And in terms of data quality, this is a perpetual problem. I think there's a, I have a few thoughts on this. One is that one thing I've always liked about modeling is it, it kind of takes data and makes it more than the sum of its parts. And so while it's true, garbage in, garbage out, you can also weave together different data sources that have their own strengths and weaknesses and make them into something that may be a little bit better or at least more insightful than the constituent parts. But we've also seen with some case studies, for example, around malaria modeling, that the act of modeling and the act of analyzing data can reveal weaknesses and can serve as justification for improving those data. So it can become a virtuous cycle where we can say, if you get me this data, I can do this for you and think how great that would be. And it can really be used as a driver to help fill the gaps. And I'd just like to add to that that the um, that that is again one reason why the issue of targeted studies is something that we're we feel strongly is within our um, our remit, even though it's it's a data generation exercise. Um, that there are just certain kinds of data that where big is big is not really what you want. You want uh, high quality, and uh, so and others where big is, is what you want. Um, and so to the extent that those are holes, uh, I think um, we will make our, an effort to fill specific holes that are, that are not being otherwise met. Um, and in terms of the synergy with other groups, there are, are, we're already identifying ways, for example, there's a new branch of the Prevention Effectiveness Fellowship called uh, Public Health Analytics, I think is the name. Um, that is uh, that is uh, that we are co-sponsoring and and um, providing some support for, including for people who are in other parts of the agency. So that's one way that we're 
trying to uh, provide a benefit rather than rather than um, taking anything away from the existing modeling, which is important to enhance. I'm going to go with Michelle, then Nixon, and then Lonnie. So I have two questions. One that builds on uh, Steve's question about how you'll interface with the division of global migration and quarantine, because that's our mandate. Is there a way that you can lighten their load so that modeling is not duplicative? Um, one, and how will you interface with them on a regular basis? And, and then the second question I have is around your inform um, area in, you know, because I'm coming from Stanford, are you involved with the social media since misinformation is such a big problem now um, with aspects of this pandemic? Do you have some sort of relationship? On the topic? Facebook and Google, et cetera. Yeah, on the topic of DGMQ, we uh, have the, had the opportunity to meet with them several times already, despite being new, and plan to continue that. I think we're open to their kind of suggestions and preferences in terms of how we involve ourselves. They have a long history of modeling as it is, and we don't intend to disrupt that in any way. So it's more kind of uh, according to their preferences and how it aligns with our mission. Um, in terms of misinformation, I don't think that we plan to get involved in combating misinformation at this point, but in my experience, pushing out good messaging and answering people's questions can be uh, at least a step in combating misinformation. And to that extent, our informed branch will, will definitely play a role. We will have experts assigned to the public. Um, and so making sure that the public has messages about what's happening and, and what we're seeing in our models will, and it already is part of our activities. Okay. Nixon, had something in the chat? Yes, yeah, so um, it's pretty much asking, uh, what are some of the uh, community levels um, intervention strategies that you're thinking of the bat right now as you're getting established um, that uh, you're hoping to to put in place um, to address some of the persistent health inequities across the country. Um, Mark, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think we should be clear that we are we are not an intervention-based part of the, the CDC. We are, we are an analytical part. So our, uh, when we talk about health equity, what we mean is trying to document uh, potential impacts on equity of various policies, trying to um, understand better the existing inequities that feed further inequities as, as new diseases come, as we've seen with COVID, um, and trying to, uh, when, we when we do models of uh, the potential outcomes of interventions, uh, study them not just by uh, by the aggregate impact, but the by the impact in various groups, including disadvantaged groups. So I, uh, we are not um, we are not going to undertake interventions. Our our goal really is to make our analytical approaches sensitive to um, and able to detect uh, existing inequities and and potential improvements or exacerbations of those by interventions. Thank you, Lonnie. <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's a pretty exciting center and, you know, changing capacity and big data and analytics and being able to leverage that now is, is a pretty exciting area. So I'm really pleased that the center is opening and I agree with Michelle, you know, we're really interested in how the center will, you know, improve the work in, in, in the division that we're looking at. But, but, I, but I would like to ask you maybe in a broader picture uh, as you look at, um, you know, predicting and analytics and, and certainly forecasting, how much work or collecting data will you do internationally? And how much would you look at the spillover from animal diseases and zoonoses into these, into these new diseases that, that we're seeing? So you have a Center for One Health and, uh, at CDC. How much are you pushing back to the origin of these diseases? Based on our current level of resources, we expect to focus primarily on questions that are of interest to the United States, which will include doing risk assessments for outbreaks that are, have emerged 
uh, abroad, but there, our scope needs to be fairly limited just based on our funding right now. We may grow to be able to expand what we can do uh, on the international front, but for now, we're mostly focused on things of interest to U.S. decision makers. As the science evolves to be able to allow us to look further upstream and to better understand what's happening in animal populations and at the human animal interface. That's another area that we would like to be able to say more about, but for now I think the science just is not able to support the kinds of quantitative um, analyses that we are interested in about where and when we could expect the emergence of new viruses. Warren, you put something I thought was important in the chat. You want to make that comment? <clears throat> Ruben? Sorry. When I heard you speak about equity, uh, I thought it's important to engage the HBCU medical leadership and also the MPH programs. There are at least uh, five of them at HBCUs across the country. I think it's really important in the beginning to engage them. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. I'll make a note of that. Uh, that. That does bring to mind one specific idea for me, which is that we are prioritizing, or one of our priorities is to support state, tribal, local, and territorial leadership. But doing that at scale is hard to figure out because in peacetime, you might not have that much to do. Uh, but when there is a crisis, then you can imagine the need to be quite great. And partnering with universities, with public health programs, with existing public health assets in the community is one of the ways that we're thinking about expanding our reach. And so I think that working with HPs, HBCUs and MPH programs, I'm just writing that down, um, is a, a really important idea. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me ask um, one question. Uh, obviously, this whole issue of of what the relative risks are in certain places. Um, so yesterday we heard from, the, from both the cruise and the airline industry um, about their perceptions of relative risks. Um, do you see your, 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 your center doing those kinds of um, sector related modeling um, to inform policymakers? Our central question is around what decision makers need. And so to the extent that there is interest or need for us to analyze sector specific questions, I think that we are open to that. Um, with DGMQ already has a set of capabilities. So again, we're not trying to step on their toes, but we, we are really driven by what is needful in terms of public health practice. Steven. Yeah, thanks. One more question if I can. Um, if I remember from reading Scott Gottlieb's uh, book about the pandemic, he made quite an issue of the fact that uh, the public health agencies weren't working as closely as they should be with the intelligence community. And, uh, and it brings up the issue of, will you be um, uh, engaging with them and uh, potentially looking at data that may not necessarily be public data? I don't think we've arrived at a decision around that, although we have definitely considered it carefully. Some of our members have a background in the intelligence community, and so we're definitely aware of the capabilities and the importance of working with the IC, but there are larger political considerations around what it would mean for CDC to be closely tied to the IC and how does that fit with our other priorities, and so I think that's still an open question for us. Michelle, you had some comment in the, in the, in the chat. It's just a comment, and I'm sure they're all on top of it, is whether you're interfacing not only with intelligence, but the USAID PREDICT program, uh, which is looking at the science of animal surveillance and trying to predict. Yeah, yeah. thanks. We, we are. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. It, it, we worried about the overlap of, uh, of names, uh, so we are certainly aware of it, um, but again, uh, at the moment, that is not our focus. The, the, the animal interface is just not our focus for reasons of trying to focus efforts on, uh, on, on a more limited set of needs. And, and I very much agree with Caitlin that um, although it is important to try to push that science forward, uh, there is at the moment no system that has a combination of limited false positives and ability to detect or, or predict the emergence of, um, of zoonoses, in my opinion. Thanks, Mark. Um, 
Let me um, let me just say um, I want to thank you. I think those are the last questions. Um, anything else for the good of the order here? All right. With that, I want to thank our speakers. Oh, um, Ed, you had a question. Yeah. Thanks, George. Um, um, so, Mark and Caitlin, I guess. So, I guess the question is just thinking of the the bigger picture in the longer term. Obviously, we're in a pandemic. Who knows when it'll all play out? I'll be an optimist and say in the next one to three years or something. But I guess the question is after the pandemic, when, and not to belittle Ebola here and MERS there, et cetera, but what will be the mandate after the pandemic with 100 FTEs? What, you know, just maybe what's the vision for three to five years from now? I aspire to be bored, but I am worried we're never going to have that moment. Um, Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about what Predict is planning during quote unquote peacetime? Yeah, I think um, that many of the questions that have come up from previous <laughs> from previous question questioners uh, emphasize that we have a, a tremendous amount of work to do um, in terms of figuring out ways to integrate data streams. That is not a, a, a problem for five people over even five years. It's a problem for uh, really close to more more like a hundred people uh, over over a long. Uh, you know, over several years of trying to get better and better at it. Um, I think so that that problem alone, I think, is is going to be a big piece of it. Um, I think that developing in government the capability and in in our center, the capability to do the very best kind of modeling um, will tie will take some time. We can we can hire good people, but the but the development of the code base and the um, the other pieces uh, is a is another thing um, and so I think you know if we have 10 years of peacetime this, this may be an issue but over the coming years I think uh, building what we need to be ready for the next one uh, is is plenty of work for for our team and just to echo it as a closing word the hurricane center you know operates year-round whether it's hurricane season or not and the military we keep as a standing capability because we recognize that we can't wait until there is a threat to spin that up. And so that's how we're thinking about public health and preparedness as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Caitlin and Mark, listen, thank you very, very much. We appreciate you being here and um, recognize that you're, you're just getting started, but this was fascinating information. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, this ends our open session. Um, so we will leave the open session um, and the recording for now. Um, we were gonna take a committee a 10 minute break. So if we could come back at uh, 110, um, when we'll go into closed session and we will spend uh, the next uh, hour and a half in closed session. So with that, I thank you. <laughs>